Shabbat Shalom. I come this morning not only as your scholar in residence, but truth be told, I have come to Canada for a second reason that even your rabbi does not know about. I am the president and treasurer of an emerging major American Jewish organization. You haven't heard of it yet, that's because our efforts have been surreptitious and silent and even secretive. I represent ASPE, A-S-P-E. That is the American Society for the Protection of Esau. <laughs> it is our contention that for the last 2,000 years, Esau has frankly, and I will be blunt, gotten a bad rap. We are sick and tired of it. We are not going to take this anymore. And from now on, we are going to mandate that all new Torah scrolls that are written in the United States, and perhaps with your help here in Canada, will highlight the story of Esau and will make it clear that in truth he wasn't so bad. Frankly, we are disgusted. We are disgusted at how Esau is presented to the Jewish world. And I want you to understand something. We are, well, to quote the famous movie, we are mad as hell, and we're not going to take it anymore. We believe that Esau has been unfairly maligned. First of all, if you compare the two brothers in our story, Jacob and Esau, let's be honest, friends, for a moment. Really. Who is the better one? We are Beit Yaakov, we are the house of Jacob, but have you ever stopped and thought about what kind of character Jacob reveals in this Torah portion? First of all, he grabs his brother's heel in the womb so as to try to supplant him. Now, this did not show up on any screen during Rebecca's uh, various visits uh, to the obstetrician. There are no uh, photographs of this anywhere. But let me tell you, this was not pretty. Number two, Esau came in famished from the hunt. All right, he's a little bit of a hypochondriac. He says that he's going to die. In fact, if you read the text carefully, it says, Anochi holech lamut, I am walking towards death. Aren't we all? I mean, really, cut the guy some slack. And so maybe he's a little hypoglycemic. As our Yiddish-speaking ancestors would have said, Ich weiß, I, know, I should know this sort of thing. And so he trades the birthright for a bowl of lentil soup and maybe a little bread on the side. And then a little bit later on in the Torah portion, Jacob adds to this monstrous moral resume by dressing up as his brother Esau, putting on hairy skins so that his blind father would think that he was in fact the oldest son and therefore would give him the blessing. Now, it is true that Rebecca put him up to it, but this does not absolve Jacob of any moral agency. We are tired of the Jacob-centric way that this text has been presented. My friends, I am going to submit to you the following idea. All right. Esau had his flaws. Okay, he was big. <laughs> he was hairy. I used to be hairy. Now I am among the follically challenged. Or actually, to be totally clear with you, I am bald by choice. It is also true that he was a hunter. 
and hunting for pleasure is trafe. It is not a Jewish thing. By the way, I have given this sermon in some communities in some regions of the United States where people have taken me aside afterwards and have said to me that I insulted 75% of the congregation. <laughs> Esau has no self-control. On the spur of the moment, he throws away his future for a bowl of soup. But let me ask you something, friends. Have you ever considered doing that? I mean, can, have you considered the soup? <laughs> in some restaurants, there are some restaurants in the United States where the pea soup is so good that I would trade my entire future <laughs> for that pea soup. No, friends, I th think it's important for us to lift up the greatest quality that Esau has. Oh, of course, he is painted as the arch anti-Semite. He is the ancestor of Amalek, which means that he is the ancestor of Haman in the story of Esther that we read on Purim. It is also true that he is identified with the Roman Empire. It is true that he is the code word and the exemplar of every anti-Semite who has tried to kill us and who has even successfully done so. No. No, I'm not going to let you off that easy. I'm going to tell you about Esau and I'm going to share something with you that no one seems to remember. Esau had one major quality that I want all of you to know. Why did he hunt? You think he hunted for the sport of it? You think he hunted just because he liked to kill deer? Didn't he realize that the buck stops here? On Yom Kippur, I will remember that. <laughs> no, my friends, there was only one reason why Esau hunted, and the text makes it very clear. He hunted in order to feed his father, Isaac, his blind father, Isaac. This was not a man who was a sadist. This was a man who, according to the rabbinic tradition, was the exemplar of kibud av, of honoring one's father. In the Midrash, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said, when I waited on my father, I dressed myself in old clothes. But when Esau took care of his father, he put on his best clothing. He was most diligent in honoring his father. Not only that, Esau tried very hard to be a good son. Look, he married a lot of women. That was the thing back then, okay? <laughs> and so he married Hittite women. This was a major shanda. Okay, and by the way, I'm, I'm telling you something very seriously now. I want you to all go home and talk to your children. I want you to talk to your grandchildren. And if you are blessed with great-grandchildren, I want you to be very clear with them. Under no circumstances are you to bring a Hittite woman or man into our home. I will not have it either. No, I understand that. But when he saw that this was a cause of tsuris, especially to his mother, Rebecca, who threatened to take an overdose of mahjong tiles, <laughs> he gave up on the Hittite women. And what did he do? He went back to the extended family, and he married women from the clan of Ishmael. And do you know why? because Ishmael understood Esau. Ishmael understood what it was like to be the kid who was cast out of the covenant. And so, my friends, I want you to understand something. As a representative of ASPE, the American Association for the Protection of Esau, we believe that Esau has been dealt with unfairly. We want to lift up for you the greatest of his qualities, which is that he actually was great at honoring his parents and trying to please his parents. And the Torah itself understands this. Because the Torah devotes an entire chapter, Genesis chapter 36, to nothing more or less than writing out the names of all the descendants of Esau and making it clear that there were kings who came out of Esau, that the people of Edom 
produced their own kings, their own monarchs. They themselves had sovereignty, actually, even before we did. And I will say this one last thing. We at Aspi are teaching the Midrash that you should all know that there will come a time when the Messiah comes, that Genesis chapter 36, the recitation of the names of the children of Esau and their descendants, that that chapter will prove itself to be the most important chapter in the entire Torah, more important than the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, more important even than the Ten Commandments. When the Messiah comes, we teach, because we have learned this from our ancestors who read these texts through the eyes of mystics. When the Messiah comes, the entire Torah will simply be the names of the children of Esau. I hope you will join me in understanding that it's coming to him. Enough of this mockery of anti-Esau animus in our community. Join me, please. I invite you to make a charitable donation <laughs> to ASPE, the American Society for the Protection of Esau, so that we can carry on the great work of understanding that this man, in the words of those who were raised in Brooklyn, Esau was robbed. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>